हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण क्षेत्र महाराज हमल डेफिनेटली Uh, and then after that, yeah, we could have a little general discussion, maybe. And then what I have to share has to do with um, Chinese Buddhism and Vaishnavism. So <laughs> take some some journey like that. <clears throat> so we have. निंदसी this inclusion of buddha in the dashavatara <clears throat> indicates the inclusion of buddhists into the hindu fold so it says here yeah if that was the topic which i was going to discuss also it is suggested that lord buddha only discouraged excessive animal slaughter <clears throat> to appease the gods to further one's own selfish motives and did not look down upon other noble tenets of the vedas buddha can be shown with karuna drishti that means in the book i'm reading from it's it's about the gita govinda and it's uh one thing is discussing is the different um uh, gestures in dance which were used in performing the gita govinda so here it's mentioning karuna drishti or viewing with compassion oh okay so that should uh, manifest that karuna drishti of 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 vishnu of krishna mm. here in particular it's associated with buddha yes of course because in dash avatar so i was saying that in that sense the lord has that karuna drishti so that karuna drishti is especially manifested in buddha of the divine that's yes we may see it like that yeah. so then <laughs> this may be looking to look at the translation in the si yagya vidher ahat mm. ahshuti jatam so he criticized the the yagyik sacrifices that were being performed in the name of shrutis or that are arisen from the shrutis सदय हृदय दर्शित पशु घातम सो ही बिकॉज ऑफ हिज कंपैशनेट हार्ट व्हाट इज इट करुणा दृष्टि ही ही दर्शित पशु घातम दैट पशु घातम दैट किलिंग ऑफ एनिमल दैट ही सॉ आह हा ही स्टॉप दैट ही स्टॉप द यज्ञ विधि व्हिच वाज इन्वॉल्विंग एनिमल किलिंग एंड दैट इज द लॉर्ड हु मैनिफेस्टेड केशव धृत बुद्ध शरीर दिस आह हा कैन आल्सो बी एन एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ सैडनेस he oh. felt sadness to see uh, this <clears throat> what was happening with the animals and therefore he stopped yeah uh, i'm just now checking i meant to check before but i wanted to check lagu bhagavatamrita um what shila rupa goswami says about the buddha uh one moment and it has a couple of pages 190 okay tata kalo sam pravrite tata kalo sam pravrite samohaya suradvisham budho नाम नंजना सूता 
Kikateshu Bhavishati. This, of course, is the verse in Canto 1 Bhagavatam, chapter 3 in the list of avatars, which is more than 10. It's what, 25 or mentioned. Uh, here, translation Sri Buddha 24 is also described there. Quote, then in the beginning of Kali Yuga, the Lord will appear as Lord Buddha, the son of Anjana, in the province of Gaya, just for the purpose of deluding those who are envious of the faithful theists. <clears throat> and it goes on to say, before he had actually appeared. Since then, he has taken birth in the village of Dharmaranya. Hmm. And um, Gopi Paranadana Prabhu explains, Dharmaranya is in the district of Gaya, which was mentioned by Sutta Goswami, Kikate Shubhavishati. Lord Brahma also describes this avatar, and now comes a verse from Canto 7, sorry, Canto 2, Chapter 7, verse 37. Devad visham nigamavart mani nishtitanam purbir maye navihita biradrishya turbi lokan gnatam mativi moham Ati pralobham vesham vidhaya bahubhashata opadarmyam. When the atheists, after being well versed in the Vedic scientific knowledge, annihilated inhabitants of different planets, flying unseen in the sky on well built rockets, prepared by the great scientist Maya. The Lord will bewilder their minds by dressing himself attractively as Buddha and will preach on sub-religious principles, O Padarmya. Hmm. And that's all that Sheila Rupa Goswami says here. Um, he mentions him briefly earlier, but that's the main thing. So, um, yes, Buddha as Vishnu avatar, of course, is an idea that generally Buddhists don't appreciate. They say, well, this is just um, the imperialism of Hinduism. <laughs> That's subsuming, subsuming Buddhism into Hinduism is what they say. So, uh, with this, uh, uh, this idea of uh, the, the, now we talked a little about the Shautaras, they the earliest mention or one of the most widespread mention is in the Jayadeva Goswami's Stotras. There was some compilation over here, but uh, we know there has been a criticism of, or there has been healthy intellectual debates between Buddhist and uh, broad Hindu traditions, Vaishnava or Smartha or whatever. So, do we have any idea of uh, whether earlier also Buddha was considered an avatar, or is? In the literature that we have, it becomes manifested only in the Dashavataras. Because there is this, uh, in some ways, the approach to Buddha seems to be similar to the approach to Shankaracharya, Shankara. That we mm. respect the person, but we contest or even uh, refute their teachings. Yeah. Um, well, the fact that Buddha is mentioned in the Bhagavatam, even if we take uh, modern scholarship on the age of the Bhagavatam as being Mark, um, I would argue as 
other scholars have argued, uh, can be marked as latest uh, end of the eighth century because uh, we have a temple in uh, Kanchipuram, the uh, what is called the what is it called Vishnu Perumal uh, yes. Temple, Vaikuntha Perumal Temple. Uh, which uh, we talk about and show in our film on the Bhagavatam, uh, which came out recently. A <laughs> uh, little plug for that. It's a beautiful. That, view, huh? Beautiful. What is it? Is contemporary way the it has been presented is a very attractive. Yes, ma'am. So we show this Vaikuntha Paramount Temple in which are so many uh, bas relief friezes, uh, which one scholar uh, spent decades studying, and he shows that the temple is a kind of three-dimensional Srimad Bhagavatam. And the temple can be dated uh, very definitely to uh, the late, I think it's um, late seventh century of the common era. So taking that as um, whatever it's called, uh, datum ad quem, or I forget the term, anyway, the latest possible date, then um, that would be several centuries before Jayadev Goswami. But uh, of course, that list is a list of more than 25, uh, or sorry, more than 10, avatars, it's 25 or so, and then elsewhere, more avatars are mentioned. Uh, um, so it's included, Buddha is included, but the mention of 10 avatars, it's not there. To my knowledge, and I, I, that's my limited knowledge, is that um, Jayadev Goswami is the, the person who identifies 10 specific 10 avatars in his Dash Avatar Stotra. So in this Vaikuntha Parimal temple also, is Buddha mentioned there also? I believe he's also there, yeah. Okay. When we say mentioned, we mean is Depict there something? Depicted. Depicted, yes. Yeah. That's fascinating. I would have to check. It's been a while since I've seen that book. Um, it's uh, the book uh, is uh, titled "Slipping My Mind Now," <clears throat> but it's uh, quite amazing analysis of of it's an analysis of the temple, but it's also an analysis of the Bhagavatam, which is uh, quite interesting. Oh yes, Maharaj. So, um, regarding Buddha, apart from the fact that there is the, the statement in the Bhagavatam, there seems to be a significant amount of uh, divergence in the description of his activities as depicted in the Bhagavatam or in the Vaishnava tradition and uh, as depicted in the in buddhist history in general yes <laughs> according to uh <clears throat> shripad uh, bhakti pragyan keshav goswami the sannyas guru of Srila Prabhupada and uh, his senior god brother um there are these are two different Buddhas. Um, he argues that the Buddha of the Bhagavatam is not the Buddha of history that is uh, known by the Buddhists. I don't, I don't know what arguments he gives, but uh, that's apparently his claim that they are. Uh, the reason you get two different descriptions is because they are two different persons or two different appearances, or what have you. Um, yeah. Interesting. But there's also the contention I have read. I mean, broadly speaking, 
um, scholars of Buddhism accept, they accept that there was an historical figure who came to be known as the Buddha, and they debate over when exactly he appeared. Was it the year 480 BCE or was it 500 something? Um, and they write books about that. But I've read one scholarly uh, book which questions whether any person that came to be known as the Buddha ever existed. Oh, that's <laughs> almost like, say, that the, the historicity of Jesus, there was a big debate in the Christian tradition. So now, at least in the mainstream, it seems to settle that Jesus was there historically, but exactly what all he did is open to question. The right. miracles can never be verified. Yeah. That way, I think even Krishna's historicity is largely accepted by mainstream scholars now. While it was a few, maybe a few decades ago, it was widely debated, but with the findings yeah. in Dwarka and other places. So, yeah. yes, ma so how um, means, I don't think Prabhupada has categorically differentiated between the two Buddhas. No, Prabhupada never mentions that. Yeah. Uh, but no, that was not his concern. He was especially because he was not uh, generally preaching in countries, in places dominated by Buddhism. Of course, Buddhism has come to the West, but it was uh, not the predominant religion. And also, the form of Buddhism that has become prominent in the West is quite distant from Buddhism as it was practiced traditionally. Well, uh, as soon as he said the form of Buddhism, okay. one has to ask which. Okay, that's also true. Uh, because when I was uh, studying in California, uh, in one course I had, um, there was one practicing Buddhist lady, and we were chatting, uh, and she mentioned that he, she said here in the greater San Francisco area, what's called the Bay Area, there are about 5 million population. Uh, she said there are 300, 300 different Buddhist groups. That's just in the San Francisco area. <laughs> so... But yes, there is a general term that is uh, common now to speak of Western Buddhism or American Buddhism. And there are histories of how Buddhism has come to the West, how it's, how it's been Americanized, how it's been transformed and so on. So, and, and then traditional, what do you mean by traditional? Because there's also a history of how in the 19th century in Sri Lanka, uh, there were efforts to, shall we say, sanitize Buddhism, or some say to Protestantize Buddhism. And to oh. say, you know, the way that Buddhism is being practiced today by the people in general of Sri Lanka, that is not traditional. Um, the real Buddhism is what we find in the Buddhist texts. And it's very parallel to what we see in the early, early 19th century uh, with Ram Mohan Roy in Bengal saying that, oh, this Buddhist, sorry, this Hinduism uh, that everyone's practicing following the Puranas is actually a degradation. And the real Hinduism is Upanishads. And so he started his mission, the Brahma Samaj, based on uh, the Advaita Vedanta and the Upanishads. 
So when you say traditional Buddhism, again, one has to say, uh, which one do you mean? And then, of course, Buddhism, what we may still want to very broadly call traditional Buddhism, we have what comes to be called Theravada, and then another major uh, direction is what comes to be called Mahayana, the great vehicle. Uh, it's now out of fashion to speak of Hinayana. Uh, the Theravada was called Hinayana, but that's considered to be a too polemical term because it means the small vehicle. Yeah. Uh, it's called the Theravada, the uh, the doctrine of uh, of the elders. Oh. But then you can subdivide that and you can subdivide Mahayana in so many ways. As it moves into China, it takes many forms. Then it goes to Japan and it takes more forms. Uh, Southeast Asia, it takes more forms and on and on. <laughs> Mm. But so broadly, when I made the statement, the point you were mentioning that Prabhupada didn't encounter, didn't speak so much in the Buddhist countries. So the point I was making that there was no need for like a serious intellectual engagement with the Buddhist teachings or with even Buddha's personality for mm. Shri Prabhupada's discourse in his audience. So even right. if even if whatever be the level of uh, whatever be the kind of buddhism that is practiced it was uh, it is not it was significantly non non metaphysical it is more of pragmatic or utilitarian kind of buddhism so in that sense the historic the, the precision of buddha's the uh, buddha's mission didn't didn't become like a significant polemical point for prabhupada that's true. <laughs> uh, they're, they're in the what we call in the West, the Middle Ages, uh, from, well, from, let's say, after Shankara uh, into the 12th, 13th century, there was a lot of mm, intellectual back and forth uh, between the different darshans, Tarshanas, mm. Nyaya, uh, especially Nyaya and, well, Vedanta, of course, mm, Sankhya, and uh, different Buddhists. So there's uh, a very strong uh, scholarship of Buddhist philosophy from that period, which is going on in the present day, because much of it is considered to be very, very rich. Um, and I haven't myself gotten into that. It's like, it's sort of like a bottomless pit. You go into, <laughs> into uh, these philosophical arguments that go back and forth, back and forth, basically arguing from the Buddhist side, Shanikavada, the idea that... Uh, there is nothing but momentary experience. And we project onto momentary experience a sense of continuity. Um, that's, that's kind of the essential idea, which is then tied uh, or is rooted in the argument of anatma, anatmavada, the idea that there is no self, no soul which of course Krishna in the very beginning of chapter two Bhagavad Gita is very strongly arguing against. Uh, um, and so on. There is a self, Atma, and it is there was never a time when it did not exist, nor will there be a time in the future that it does not exist. And based on that argument, he's 
uh, urging Arjuna to fight and not to be concerned that he may be somehow actually killing uh, his relatives. He's saying, no, you're not killing them. They will be getting new bodies. Don't worry. <laughs> hmm. So, how are you correlating this with Buddhism? Are you because Buddhists don't exactly accept the concept of soul as we understand it, also. Well, see, that's also contested. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say, uh, we, okay. we, in, in our tradition, you know, as we argue against other traditions, we tend to simplify those other traditions. Uh, and it turns out that it's not entirely clear um, whether the Buddha's position was anatmavada or not. And this is said both by uh, practitioners of Buddhism and by scholars of Buddhism, that the jury is out, which means to say the jury has not come back in uh, to give their verdict. They're still discussing uh, were they saying Anatmavada is the final truth or were they not? And I found an interesting passage in the Dhammapada, uh, which is one of the more famous of the vast collection of, uh, uh, Buddhist scriptures from the Pali, what's called the Pali Canon. Yes. And in this, which uh, Dhammapada, which is considered a collection uh, of, of sayings, um, presumably from the Buddha, um, there's a chapter, chapter 26, called the Brahmana. And it's giving kind of description of what is a real Brahman. And it says, for example, uh, the one meditating, free of dirt, quietly sitting, tasks done, free of intoxicants, who has obtained the goal supreme, that one I call a Brahmana. By day glows the sun, at night shines the moon. In war array the monarch glows, meditating a Brahmana glows. But all day and night the Buddha glows in splendor. Uh, a Brahmana would not attack a Brahmana or let loose wrath upon him. Shame on one who strikes a Brahmana and greater shame on one who lets loose wrath upon him. So we sometimes understand, oh, the, the Buddhists, they were condemning Brahmanism. Um, but this last verse that I read uh, is saying shame on the one who it, uh, would attack a Brahmana. No, the Brahmins are to be respected, but it goes on at some length uh, to describe what is a, what are the qualifications of a Brahmana. Uh, another example, like water on a lotus petal, like a mustard seed on the point of an awl, which is a iron for shaping tools and so on. Uh, who is not who is not smeared or affected with sensualities? That one I call a brahmana. Oh, this is, this water on a lotus a petal is lotus leaf is very striking to our traditions. Padma Patram Ivamba Sabagoita says. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there's some overlap, and of course in Bhagavad Gita. Um, there are some interesting, I would say, allusions to Buddhism. Uh, verse 39 of chapter 2. 
Thus far I have described this knowledge to you through analytical study. Now listen as I explain it in terms of working without fruit of result. O son of Prita, when you act in such knowledge, you can free yourself from the bondage of work. <clears throat> I had thought of maybe 270, 271, 72 as, 72 as a little bit more Buddhist thing. But how does this relate with, relate with Buddhism? Uh, just the word buddhi is there. Okay. And where does the idea, see, Buddh, what we call in English Buddhism uh, is uh, in Sanskrit generally called bodha, bodha vada. Right, Bodhavada, okay. Um, but what is that word? Where is it coming from? It's coming from um, from Bod, which means to awaken. Um, and Bud, Budhi, of course, means intelligence, or we take it often as intelligence, it can mean discernment, can mean reasoning, also. Uh, and so this becomes. Uh, the idea in Buddhism, the Buddha is the awakened one. Um, but yes, you mentioned verse 72, Brahma Nirvanam Richati. And that comes again in the fifth chapter two or three times. Uh, the idea of Nirvana is very much associated with Buddhism as their final goal at least in Theravada, uh, to reach uh, nirvana, which means, literally it means uh, extinguishment, nirvat, uh, a blowing out. <laughs> um, but if you look a little into, you know, Buddha, what the Buddhists say, <laughs> Uh, they don't always uh, take it as that. They say, no, it's a much deeper understanding. And it's an understanding which, again, doesn't necessarily mean the annihilation of atma, of the self. Um, but it's, it's ambiguous. It's very ambiguous in, in Buddhism because, as I see it, what... What they're arguing is to question and to keep questioning and to keep questioning whatever it is you are thinking is the self. They're saying you have to keep, you have to keep questioning that. Oh, okay. So, so in a sense... It's kind of constant deconstruction, but it's not necessarily ending in no self. And I would suggest the reason, I, for me, the reason to doubt that they really, even if they say there's no self, uh, is their very strong uh, emphasis in Buddhist ethics on karana, on compassion. Why should there be a concern of compassion if there's ultimately no self? That's fascinating, okay. No, but how is karuna related with self or suffering? Suffering is like the first fundamental truth of Buddhism, dukkha. Ignition of cause of dukkha as trishna, thirst, uh, or hankering. And then they go to marga, uh, a process, the eightfold path. Yes. And from there you go to nirvana. Uh, the perfection of following the marga. Um, anyway, it's to me a question, how is it that uh, karana is so prominent uh, if we simply say it's necessary to remove dukkha? One has to question why 
Why be concerned to remove dukkha? If there's no self. Okay. Yeah, who is suffering and whose suffering is to be removed? Okay. There's a sense of, there's a who. There's, some, there's someone there who is suffering. <laughs> uh, and also, you know, the idea of reincarnation without a self that reincarnates also is very difficult to uh, rationally defend. Yes, there, there's been a lot of, of course, they have their explanation, but um, it's complicated. It's, it's the, sort of the, the analogy is given, given of uh, passing a flame from, from one candle to another. You're passing on. So there's a continuity in some sense based on karma. Uh, but then one also may have to ask, um, how, how is that continuity possible if shanika vada, if uh, there is only instant instantaneity? Is that a word? I don't know. Okay, instantaneity, right. Anyway, as I said, I'm no one to speak on Buddhist philosophy because I haven't studied it. Uh, but there is another point, and this maybe can lead into our um, my slide. Um, and that is in Mahayana, there's a very prominent position put on the notion of shunyata or empt what we translate as emptiness. And then you get volumes and volumes and volumes uh, of explanation. What is this shunyata? Uh, what is this em emptiness? So I want to propose that in our Gaudiya Vaishnavism, we also have, on the one hand, we reject Shunyavada, and on the other side, we have our own Shunyavada. And what is that? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Yugaitam nimeshena, chakshusha pravishaitam, shunyaitam jagatsarvam. Govinda Virahena me that is shunya, it is empty. Uh, so long as there is Govinda Viraha, as long as there is absence of Govinda, and therefore Yugaitam uh, Nimesha, a moment seems like a yuga. Uh, and and because this world is empty without Govinda. Oh, beautiful correlation. Yuga item, shunya item jagat saram. So his shunya is not so much like an existential voidness, but more of an experiential voidness. That, uh, yeah, it, it's not ontological uh, emptiness. Usually Buddhists don't like the word void. When you say, oh, shunya, shunyata, that means voidness. No, no, it's not voidness. <laughs> Interesting. What is the difference between, say, in their understanding between voidness and emptiness? It's more I don't like know. <laughs> emptying of all the passions and the cravings that cause yeah, it's samskaras. Em emptying of all, uh, all of our conceptions, all of our... Um, all of our notions of what uh, is causality, so emptying everything, uh, then we start to experience uh, reality uh, oh. as it is, tata, tatatva. True. <clears throat> so overall, we could say that, that uh, what are considered to be the say the differences between either Buddha's uh, life's narrative or Buddha's teachings and say what is understood in Buddhism and what is understood in, in Vaishnavism maybe the differences can be understood from more historical factors or contextual factors like you are saying that we may think there are a lot of differences between Buddhism and Hinduism Buddhism and uh, Vaishnavism, Vaishnav teaching or Bhagavad Gita's teachings. 
but that may de be depending on a reductionistic understanding of buddhism also they like that what i want to what i want to suggest is um you know a general concern that i have is how can we as vaishnavas um engage in mature and mutually enriching uh, communication, dialogue uh, with practitioners of other traditions, where the aim is not to simply defeat and, you know, put down others' traditions, but rather to appreciate them, uh, to find, um, find nuggets of value in them and similarly to share our nuggets of value. And what this involves is uh, a great deal of skill, a great deal of patience. What I was just putting across as, you know, it was also, I was expressing in a very kind of stereotyped way, my understanding of certain Buddhist concepts. But if one really wants to go into some depth, uh, one needs to really take time to understand. That can involve some study and also just dialogue, listening to people. Um, one reason I say that is because I spend time in the Far East. I visit, uh, well, I haven't been able to now for almost two years because of the pandemic. Uh, but um, as I'm sure you know, Buddhism is quite prominent in the Far East. It's especially prominent in Taiwan. And one time when I was visiting Taiwan, it struck me as I was visiting one very beautiful Buddhist temple, I thought, how wonderful. Krishna is so kind. He has taken the form of Buddha uh, for these people. Uh, the people of these uh, places, these countries, worship the Lord. Uh, and one can see when people come into the temple, their uh, gestures, their spirit of, of devotion. They have some devotion for the Buddha. And however much, whatever, you know, motivation we may think is there, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, we can appreciate, we can appreciate the devotion as well. And uh, that doesn't even have to be, it doesn't have to be a patronizing uh, appreciation like, oh yes, they also have some devotion, but we have the real thing. This is a very, very, I would say, a radically different approach than what might be used in a proselytizing mission. We as a movement yes, have identified ourselves as a proselytizing mission, at least to some extent in the first generation, and even now to a significant yeah. extent. So... But how, how much, how deeply can we uh, roots down into cultures if we keep a sort of uh, chauvinistic attitude in our preaching? Mm -hmm. Preaching must be there. I'm not saying we shouldn't be vigorous. We shouldn't. Uh, sometimes we need to be very challenging. That's all right. Um, but... Um, we need to also be self-reflective and see that our preaching is not based on insecurity, that it's based on genuine conviction. And um, to what extent is it possible, instead of trying to prevail over others, to what extent can we appreciate and therefore cooperate and value others uh, others' convictions. Mm. 
one criticism I've heard of this approach is that then if you focus so much on valuing and appreciating others, then what is what is the need to at all preach also then? What is the need to proselytize? You can just keep appreciating each other wherever they are. Of course, I'm not. I don't agree with that, but I'm just taking a devil's advocate over here. So yeah. we see there is a in our tradition also there is always like you said there was a healthy intellectual discourse and even debate. So, but it was was it patronizing in the past in the traditions or we say that now it's a multicultural world, so we need to adapt ourselves. <laughs> Um, let's see, where to start? <laughs> but appreciating others does not mean one cannot share one's own convictions. But one's own convictions, to be real convictions, how they maintain themselves as real convictions involves a process of ongoing nourishment of those convictions. And nourishment is not simply a matter of uh, polemically arguing to prevail over others. As I'm sure you know, there are three levels According to Nyaya philosophy, there are three levels of debate. So if we want to debate, that's fine. But let's keep it on the level of vada and not degenerate to the level of jalpa or vitanda. Hmm. Where vada, the, the definition of vada in Nyaya is an honest pursuit of the truth. Whereas Jalpa is uh, uh, characterized by simply wanting to defeat your opponent uh, is characterized by insulting. Okay. One is simply exchanges insults. <laughs> I love okay. this point that in what, now that you speak it, it is evident, but the way you articulated it, that maintaining our convictions, the process of that is not simply trying to impose our conviction on others, but it is actually, say, we interact with others, we appreciate their convictions, and still we, we reinforce our own convictions. So the, so, so the polemical approach is, that's why you said, it arises from fear or insecurity rather than from a deep conviction. Okay. It, it can be the case. It's often the case that polemic is based on insecurity rather than conviction. But also, um, you said you use the word reinforced, which is a kind of image of, uh, you know, construction. But I wanted to have um, other images like gardening, you know, you are cultivating and also um, enriching the idea of enriching one's conviction uh, by appreciating others. Uh, anyway, that's a bigger topic. Uh, yeah. I give a seminar sometimes on what I call dialogical Vaishnavism, I may have mentioned in another one of our discussions, uh, where I'm trying to help devotees to see how we can, uh, in, in thoughtful ways, engage, interact with uh, people of other religious traditions in ways that uh, are beneficial and growing to, uh, to everyone without simply trying to, um, you know, convert, to convert others. Um, maybe we should go to my slideshow for this uh, presentation I made some years ago in University of Renmin. Yes, Father, certainly. 
This is uh, University of Renmin in uh, Beijing in China. I was invited by a professor of Buddhism who's also a practicing Buddhist uh, to give. And this is also based on an article which I've written, which uh, Krishna willing or Buddha willing is uh, going to is going to be published very soon in Chinese in a book uh, in which I am a book on the Bhagavad Gita, but discussing other traditions. Oh, okay. It's being published uh, by Yunnan University Press. Uh, so uh, this is a presentation that I gave in, uh, in Beijing about five years ago. And I just pulled it up and dusted it off. Uh, I gave at one university in a class, a course on Buddhist, um, Buddhist thought, Buddhist philosophy. And uh, what I'm doing here is attempting to make a comparison. And the comparison is um, on the one side with a particular Buddhist missionary of the fifth and sixth century. His name uh, in Sanskrit is Bodhidharma. And he had a huge influence. He's originally from India and he was originally uh, from a Hindu Brahmin background and he converted, so to say, to Buddhism. And then he went to China uh, to South China, and he's become uh, a major figure in Chinese Buddhism. Let's do the next slide. <clears throat> now, I discussed the whole question of comparing religion, and I'm not going to spend time on that here, uh, but I want to make this point the third uh, bullet point here, comparison is unavoidable and it is integral to thinking. When we think, we compare. And when we compare, we think. And so it's a question of whether we make good comparisons or poor comparisons and how to judge whether a comparison is good or not, uh, that is a bigger discussion that I won't go into here. I'm, of course, trying to make a good comparison, but it's a very, at the same time, sketchy. It's a very limited comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Yes, I think it was, was it Aristotle or someone who said that metaphors are the essence of thinking? So what are you saying is... Comparison is vital. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I'm touching some more on issues of comparison here. I call it methods and madness. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what does it mean to compare? Uh, comparing for what purpose? Um, to say, oh, that's like comparing apples and oranges is a way to dismiss the whole effort to compare. But if you think about it, you can compare apples and oranges in any number of ways. <laughs> That's uh, a good way of and, taking and then, wisdom and turning and it then, Yeah. And then where does the person doing the comparison stand? What is the position from which a comparison is made? And then finally, on the bottom left, we always compare with respect to and then fill in the blank. So you have two points of comparison. In this case, let's say yoga and Buddhism. And you're doing a comparison, not exactly just with each other. Rather, you are comparing to third object or principle or abstract concept. So that's something, of course, we could 
say more about, but let's keep going. So here I'm just um, giving some context for what I'm trying to, to do with this comparison. Uh, there is in China a, a huge interest in yoga. There are yoga studios in all the cities of China. And also in the academic sphere, there's a growing interest in what's called contemplative studies. Uh, the, the study of meditation, the study of contemplation. It's very interesting, actually. And then if we think of the, brighter, the wider uh, context of how much conflict there is in the world, then the question of resolving conflict uh, brings in the value of making comparison for the sake of resolving conflict. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so here I'm just explaining something which I uh, studied uh, as part of my own research for my doctoral research, uh, which I found very helpful. This was a comparative religious ideas project that took place over three or four years at Boston University, uh, which produced three volumes of quite in-depth uh, analysis of the whole prospect of comparison uh, involving some 20 scholars, uh, both specialists in particular religious traditions and also generalists in philosophy and philosophy of re religion. Um, and I'll just jump now to the bottom because uh, the middle idea is a little more difficult. The bottom, uh, viewing with parallax. So this is the idea that our ordinary sight, we have by Krishna's grace, two eyes. Uh, when we close one eye, we immediately feel deprived of perspective. Uh, what we see is impaired. Uh, we see in one sense almost as much as what we see with two eyes, but not really. And so what I want to say is that one way of appreciating the value of Comparison is that it's a way of winning uh, perspective on oneself, one's own convictions, one's own practices, as well as better perspective on others, other persons and their convictions and their practices. So next slide, please. So here, parallax basically refers to you are saying two eyes means we look at our tradition and others' tradition. Is that what you are referring to? Or we look at others' yeah, tradition more and then that helps us to look at our tradition uh, with a second eye? Or Something like that. Um, actually, I used this analogy for the work which I did, uh, which was a comparison within the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Um, I compared uh, one particular temple and their practice, their tradition in, uh, in Vrindavan with one particular temple uh, in, in London, Bhaktivedanta Manor. So the tradition is the same and yet, and yet there are many historical and geographical differences. Oh, okay. Uh, and so there the analogy may, maybe works better because our two eyes are very close to each other and yet it makes such a difference for us. We can see uh, with perspective. Um, in terms of comparing, say, Vaishnava tradition with Buddhist tradition, we can say, well, oh, these are extremely different traditions. So how does this analogy work? Well, first we might want to look for similarities. 
it's easy to find differences. What about similarities? <laughs> Considering that we're all human, we're all on the same planet, we all have the same uh, existential problems, birth, old age, disease, and death. And that's recognized in Buddhism very well. Uh, I have a little story to tell with that. Many years ago, uh, I visited uh, Thailand, not Taiwan, but Thailand. And I went to one um, Buddhist ashram. It was out in the country. It was a beautiful ashram. And uh, the, the monks and nuns who were there, it was both monks and nuns. It was a kind of Buddhist mission. They were very much missionizing. Um, they had a printing press. They had their own press and like that. So um, one nun took us on a tour of uh, their, whole, their whole ashram. And uh, one of the places she brought us, she brought us into their, what we would call a preaching room place where you invite people to come and sit down and be comfortable and then you can explain you know what is Christian consciousness to them so they had such a room and in this room <laughs> they had a they had a real full-size human mummy in a glass case Mummy, okay. A mummy, yeah. They had, presumably it had been a real human body, uh, and they had wrapped this body in, as one does in uh, whatever it is, they wrap. So it was mummified. So basically what you were seeing, but in such a way that you saw very much the features of that body. It was a kind of small uh, small human figure. But the point is, you could see, you know, very graphically, there you are standing right next to a dead human body. <laughs> and they were using this for preaching. They were saying, you know, this is what you are going to become. <laughs> My God, so this is a graphic example of the universality of certain truths. Yeah, I thought, well, this is really clever. We should have something like this also. <laughs> yeah. Okay, shall we go to the next slide? Yes, Maharaj. This is the one? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, this is just really introducing. So I want to speak about uh, Bodhidharma and yoga specifically the yoga of Bhagavad Gita. And uh, as I mentioned, Bodhidharma was a particular um, missionary of Buddhism who converted. Uh, I think the next slide I give some details. Yeah, he grew up in South India. Uh, he was born in a Brahmin family, converted to Buddhism, and then he went uh, eventually to what is now a very large city in South China, Guangzhou, which is close to Hong Kong. And uh, Buddhism was already established in China by this time, but it was a kind of priestly Buddhism, if you'd like. It was a Buddhism that was uh, supported by uh, the political powers of the day. And, and so what Bodhidharma brought was, um, it was uh, quite radically different from the Buddhism that was known in China at the time. So, Bodhidharma 
comes known eventually as what's called the first patriarch. I don't know what the Chinese or the or the Pali or the Sanskrit the first patriarch would be of Chan Buddhism. Now the word Chan is derived quite directly from the Sanskrit dhyana. And dhyana oh. means meditation. And when Chan Buddhism migrates to Japan, what does that become? It becomes Zen Buddhism. Oh, amazing. Dhyan, Chan, Zen. Right. Okay. So basically, it's meditational Buddhism, and it's a kind of Buddhism which is not interested in the externals that had developed by that time of Buddhism in China. Okay. It seems that the same like Brahminical ritualism that Buddhism uh, rebelled against in India, it became ensnared in the same thing in, in China. And Bodhidharma seems to have tried to act against it. Yes, maybe that's a simplified way to put it, but yeah, okay. um, for yeah. our understanding, that's okay. <laughs> yes. Right. yes. So. Now, there's a story because Bodhidharma died and was buried uh, in, uh, in South China. I think it's in South China. There's a monument. Uh, there's a, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, in any case, he died in South China. And then there was a story that he was seen three years after his death. He was seen walking in southwestern China. Okay. This seems to be like the resurrection. And he was of... asked. He was on his way to India. That he was the story is he was on his way back to India. And the story is that the person who saw him stopped him and asked him, and I guess he recognized because he had become very famous. Hey, aren't you Aren't you Bodhidharma? <laughs> oh, and he said, "Yes, that's that's me. Um, I'm I'm on my way back to India." Mm -hmm. And so there's some iconography of Bodhidharma. He's walking uh, with a stick, and on the end of a stick is one shoe. One shoe. So the story is. One shoe. So they went back. The story is that they dug up his, um, his where he was buried, hmm. where his shoes had also been buried, and there they found only one shoe. In other words, he had taken and he had gone. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the legend. But let's go on to the next. Okay, this is uh, the Chinese, the original uh, of the, it's the first of four statements, which is uh, of Bodhidharma. It's called Outline of Practice. And it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's whole, this whole book consists of four statements, and this is one of them in Chinese. So when I presented this, I gave it to the Chinese students. They could read this directly. I didn't need to translate it and then translate back into Mandarin. Okay, let's have the next, next slide. So this is an outline of this um, first statement that Bodhidharma makes. Uh, the general term for it is called uh, requiting injury or suffering injustice. So in his statement, he's acknowledging one's past karma 
And he's saying that this is the cause of suffering. And he's also saying that there is no one else to blame for my suffering. And he is advising, because this is uh, about practice, practice of Chan Buddhism, he's advising that one should not hold any resentment nor any complaining. And he says, in conclusion, thus one is yoked with principle, according to uh, the translation that I found for it. And of course, the word yoked in Sanskrit is yukta, uh, which comes from the word yoga. So uh, here we see perhaps uh, some points that a Vaishnava has no problem with. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here you see, by the way, the iconography, the image of Bodhidharma with the shoe on the on the back of his stick. Amazing. This is uh, it's very similar to Bhagavad Gita 13, 8 to 12, where Krishna talks about the symptoms of knowledge, acknowledging suffering and... Mm. The, yeah. Then... Janma, janma mrityu jaravyadhi dukkha doshana darshanam. But he's also giving cause as oneself not to blame others. Yeah. Um, so then I go on from what I've just read, that first statement to point out from Bhagavad Gita, uh, what I'm saying is a similar advice uh, from Bhagavad Gita 2.14 about mental equanimity, toleration of the dualities of heat, cold, happiness, and distress. And then from chapter six, uh, which is called Dhyana Yoga, and I make this point uh, that Dhyana is the Sanskrit from which comes Chan, uh, that well-wisher, friend, enemy, stranger, neutral, inimical, relative, saint, and even sinner in relation to all these equal regard is prized. Oh. That I took sort of my own translation there. That's beautiful. And we can, Buddha, which then we can go. Regard is prized. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. Then that that's the second statement in the original. And the next slide. So he makes these points. Um, sentient beings lack a self and are all whirled around by conditions and karma. Suffering and joy are to be equally accepted for both arise from conditions. What does lack and of then, mean? Well, this is the issue, right? So then I found that there is uh, I found two translations in English of Bodhidharma's uh, statements, and one of another's one of the two translations is by someone who is called Red Pine, and he gave this translation: "As mortals, we are ruled by conditions, not by ourselves." Notice that that translation is not denying the self. It's simply, simply saying that we are ruled by conditions rather than by ourselves. And that, I would suggest, we can agree with. For the conditioned soul, we are ruled by conditions, not by ourselves. I thought actually these are two separate statements. But they are two separate, two translations of the same statement. Same statement. Okay. Yeah. So the second Let's is go more go concise. Hmm. Yes. It's, uh, it's more concise. I don't know if it was the complete, I don't remember. 
I wanted to just focus on that. Yeah. And the next, can we have the next slide? And this is again my translation of Gita 617. For one who appropriately consumes sports, works, sleeps, and keeps awake, sorrow removing yoga occurs. So, yukta haravihara yukta cheshta sya karma su, yukta svaknava bodhasya yoga bhavati dukkaha. Sorrow removing yoga occurs. Okay, and the next. Have you done translation like this for all the verses of the Gita? Or whichever? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, it was beautiful. You're just following line by line. Hmm? Nice. Uh, of course, you, of course, you know, uh, His Holiness Ridayananda Goswami has done a quite literal translation of the Gita. Yes, I've seen that. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, next. We're, yes. Um, yeah, uh, this is still the second practice. He says, unmoved by the winds of joy, one is mysteriously in accordance with the path. Another translation, those who remain unmoved by the wind of joy silently follow the path. Um, Interesting. It's so a, the idea of not being moved, being unmoved, by the winds of joy and sorrow is also certainly there in the Gita. It's um, put in a sort of poetic here, way here with the idea of wind being moved. But we also have that in chapter two, being moved by the winds. Uh, the, the, the mind which is not uh, fixed uh, becomes moved by the winds of the senses. Yes, that's... Remarkable similarity. And, and because in that, what we just saw, there's the idea of mysterious. So then I called attention to uh, this uh, reference, Rahasyam Uttamam, uh, which Krishna gives in chapter four, uh, that this is the highest, our ultimate secret, this teaching of uh, of yoga. Okay, and the next. <laughs> and let's go on. Okay, this is uh, the third teaching of Bodhidharma. It's about uh, the process of putting a stop to the cause of worldly suffering. And here again, we have two different translations, one named Broughton, I don't remember his first name. P principle is the <laughs> obverse of the conventional. Quiet mind and practice, no action. Forms follow the turnings of fate. That's kind of obscure. <laughs> Pine's translation, they, the persons of insight, choose reason over custom. Okay. They fix their minds on the sublime and let their bodies change with the seasons. I think a much more accessible translation. Yes. So, so reason over custom. Uh, and here the word reason may be translated uh, from the word buddhi, I, I'm just guessing here, but buddhi uh, can be translated as reason if you go from the Sanskrit to English. Yes. And then I point out from chapter six, Gita, nispriha sarvakam ebhyaha, um, not being touched, not being uh, attached uh, to desires, to all desires. And then from chapter four, seeing inaction in action and action in inaction, right? Yes. Uh, is 
is uh, a key verse of the fourth chapter. Mm -hmm. And then I suggest how we might connect the notion of shunyata with the notion paramatma, because I'm playing now a little with the English. Shunyata, we may say, means nothing or nothingness. And paramatma, I want to suggest, can be no thing. The self, atma or paramatma, is not a thing. So we also have nothing, nothing, because we have higher self. Okay. And then uh, we have from the sixth chapter again, for one whose self is conquered, who is completely pacified, the higher self has been well established. Whether in cold, heat, happiness, and sorrow, or indeed whether in honor or dishonor. Uh, and I mention also the famous image of the burning house. Krishna refers to this world in the eighth chapter as Dukalaya Ashashvata. And a Dukalaya is a house, you could translate it as a house of, of suffering, uh, a burning house. And that I think is also a very common image in Buddhist traditions. So when you're saying burning house, is burning house is a common image in Buddhist tradition or it's a general metaphor of the stressful situation? Uh, I'd have to check. It's I'm, My memory is pretty rusty about the little bit of Buddhism that I've studied, but I believe it's a common image okay. in um, Buddhist texts as well. They also have the image of the, the person who has been uh, struck by an arrow. In their explanation of the problem of the origin of suffering, they say it's not a question of working out what is the origin. Just get the arrow out of your body immediately so that you don't bleed to death. Yes. That arrow metaphor, I also heard about it. That's, yeah. uh, that's also typical of the overall Buddhist orientation. It's more, uh, more, about, more practical than philosophical. That rather than delving into metaphysics of the origin of things, it focuses more on, yeah. more on actions that can be done now. Yeah. <clears throat> For one whose self is conquered, that verse, Jitatmana Prashantas. Prashantasya Paramatma Samahita Shitoshna Sukadukeshu Tata Mana Apamana Yo. So the, the Atma is Jitta, is, is conquered. Uh, but what does that mean? Paramatma Samahita, one has reached the higher self. So I'm, you know, in a gentle way, I'm introducing this to, uh, to the people in China. <laughs> okay, next. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. This is the fourth, and here I gave, I think, the whole translation. Uh, as to the fourth, the practice of according with dharma, the principle of intrinsic purity is viewed as dharma. According to this principle, all characteristics are void without defilement and without attachment, without this and that. The sutra says, in dharma there are no sentient beings since it is free of the impurities of sentient beings. In Dharma, there is no self because it is free of the impurities of self. The one of insight who is able to believe in and understand this principle should practice according to Dharma. 
So, uh, okay. Um, first of all, the, there's a significant difference in the notion of Dharma. What is Dharma in Buddhist tradition? Um, we could take this as a point of departure for argument, uh, but let's see what my comments were in the next slide. Yeah, so I, th I sort of throw in 1866 to, to make the point that what is the broader issue in both cases? The broader issue is pursuit of authenticity. What is real? And so I point Sarvadharman Paritya Jama Mekam Sharanam Raja. Uh, the uh, teachings of the Gita, we can say, go even a step further of radicalization to say, instead of trying to pursue what we are, what we are thinking is Dharma, because if you look at the, you can go back to the previous statement again. At the end, it says, the one of insight who is able to believe in and understand this principle should practice according to Dharma. Well, the one of insight means there must be someone, there must be some person who has insight. But aside from that, there's a lot of emphasis here on seeking Dharma. In Dharma, there are no sentient beings. In Dharma, there is no self. Okay, so what does Krishna say? Krishna says, Sarva Dharma and Pritya Jag, give up your dharmas. Mam ekam and follow me. And this me, of course, we understand is Krishna, and Krishna is explaining who he is throughout the Bhagavad Gita. So it's, I'm, I'm bringing it all back to personalism. Uh, but at the same time, I'm suggesting it may be possible to appreciate this idea of shunyata, this principle, all characteristics are void. Uh, so in the, in the context of the Gita, sarva dharma and paritya all these dharmas, give them up. They have no substance, they are void. Mam ekam, and just give, come to the one real substance. Okay, we can go back then. So um, here I just do a bit of summarizing. We have in Buddhist texts the term dharma, and I point out that in the Bhagavad Gita, dharma is, uh, is also a matter of concern, and ultimately it's about setting aside all of our limited notions of what is dharma. Then uh, the term Buddha and Buddhi, of course, is there very prominent in Buddhist texts. Buddhi yoga we have in Bhagavad Gita. The term Nirvana is there in Buddhist texts. We have it also in, in the context of, of self-perfection in Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Nirvana. And uh, the term Pragna is prominent in Buddhist texts for wisdom. So we have also in the Gita, Stita Pragna, Stita Pragna Tadochate. Um, some have said, some scholars say that the Bhagavad Gita is a commentary or a rebuttal, a um, response to, I think it's the Lotus Sutra uh, of the Buddhist tradition. Uh, and therefore, they say, we find these terms in the Bhagavad Gita. Whatever, uh, but I think it's interesting to be aware of these, let's say, crossovers. 
um, connections. That's okay. a lot of, lot of significant parallels. Is it, is, that, yeah. is it all core concepts in the Gita? Maybe yeah. Nirvan might not be that prominent, but Dharma, Buddhi, and Pragya, they are quite central to the Gita. Yes. Uh, then I just point to the famous uh, statements of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, Atta Yoga Anushasanam. Now at this auspicious moment of transition begins the instruction in the discipline of yoga following the past tradition. Um, and the next verse, I think I gave the next sutra, did I? Um, no, I jumped. <laughs> okay. I, I skipped uh, yoga chitta vritti nirodha. So tat prati shedartam eka tat vavyasaha. To prevent and negate those impediments, which have been listed earlier in the Yoga Sutras, the distractions and their correlates, the practice of a single reality, one principle, is enjoined or prescribed. Eka tattva abhyasa, uh, the practice of yasa of one tattva, one principle is prescribed. Okay, I don't remember now what I put next, if anything. Oh, <laughs> okay, then. Um, the, the Yoga Sutras have a, um, a sort of classical commentary. Uh, the commentator is identified as Vyasa, who is generally not seen as the same Vyasa of the Mahabharata and, and the Puranas. In any case, he is refuting uh, the Buddhist ideas of Vijnanavada and Kshanikavada. Um, and we won't get into this, but the idea that the momentary mind is fixed momentarily on some idea or some cognition, and out of this, uh, this momentary mind arises, and then comes another idea, and then another idea. Um, so then the question comes up, and the challenge is, where is uh, the distraction which the Buddhist seeks to overcome? Um, okay, that's something which, again, my own engagement with this is rusty, so I won't be able to elaborate on. <laughs> but in any case, Vyasa is rejecting Pravaha chitta, the flow of chitta, because there's no accounting for memory. There's a, there's a problem in uh, Kshanikavada of accounting for memory. How is it that we remember if, if all we are really experiencing is one image after another, after another, after another. Okay, next. Maharaj, I'm just trying to understand. Through this, you are demonstrating how to, how to engage in a comparative study, means, uh, or what is the broader perspective, means you, did, you give this as a presentation to the students there, but from the, our podcast perspective, I'm just trying to understand the the relevance or the purpose where why you are discussing this well here i'm giving a presentation which i gave in china where i wanted to simply show that there has been um not sort of moving away from the notion of dialogue i was moving into the notion of of debate to show that there has been a back and forth of okay uh, of uh, philosophy uh, since centuries, and 
So there are certain ideas in Buddhism because these students, they're not aware of, they, they hardly know that Buddhism came from India. Really? They kind of know, but they generally sort of forget. In general, people in China are not even aware that Buddhism came from India. <laughs> That's amazing. So I wanted to show, you know, there's, there's, there's so much uh, in India, including Buddhism and including yoga, which now you're taking up in China. And uh, there's been discussions over centuries on these subjects. So, but going back to comparison, um, and I don't know if we're taking too much time for this, but um, anyway. Yes, Maharaj. I don't know how your schedule is, depending on, usually we have about a two hour podcast. Yeah, so, I have a few minutes more. Yes. So you can take it forward as well. Okay. So going back to comparison, um, a first step I would say is we do want to acknowledge differences. Uh, we don't want to artificially say everything is the same. Uh, to, to make everything sort of into a facile, artificial or superficial sameness is it doesn't help anyone. So we want to recognize differences. And then one particular process of doing comparison, I'm mentioning the name here of a scholar at Harvard University who uh, was my doctoral supervisor. He was in Oxford for a period of three years, exactly when I was there. And he has done a lot of um, pioneer work in comparative theology between Christianity and Vaishnavism in particular. And he has a particular method of comparison, which is to look very closely at uh, written passages in uh, two, the two traditions of comparison. And when he finds two passages which have points which he feels are uh, worth putting in juxtaposition because of similarities, then he will do that. In fact, he will even literally have them printed in two columns on the same page to be able to read one and then the other, and then go back to the first and then back to the other and back to the first. And in this way, going back and forth, back and forth, he says there, something happens within you. You, the reader, become changed. And you become changed for the better because you, uh, you gain by that a richer appreciation of your own tradition at the same time that you appreciate the other tradition. But he also analyzes, he's, um, he does extensive analytical study. Uh, he's written one book called um, Hindu God, Christian God, and there's a subtitle, which I don't remember, uh, in which he does very careful uh, theological analysis uh, of Christian and Hindu articulations of what is the nature of God, uh, just as we have in Jiva Goswami's Chatsandarbha's uh, mm. systematic theology. So he, he brings together and he tries to see how can we compare on the platform of reasoning, he says he wants to particularly emphasize reasoning, uh, 
theological reasoning in order to do that kind of comparison. And then uh, comparison can go into uh, the wider context of our human condition. Thinking about, you know, what is our situation in this world? Uh, this situation uh, predominated by ignorance and suffering uh, and some hope and some happiness and so on. And then cultivating, having a culture of comparison where we may find points of convergence, which is to say, not sameness, but complementarity. Complementarity, where one idea, one practice, one artistic expression, uh, can somehow or other complement our own vision as an expanding vision of uh, the ultimate reality. Yeah, so... I'm thinking this. we could use this actually even for our intra-institutional debates where we have debates between devotees on different issues like female diksha guru or so many other things like that. Yeah. Hmm, this is a beautiful approach. Yeah, Francis Clooney is that Hindu, that Hindu God, Christian God. I have read that book. It's quite, oh, a, you have. it's a very technical book in a sense. Among the various yeah. of academic it's authors. serious scholarship. Most yeah. devotees don't have an idea what is, you know, what is the uh, level of uh, thinking of of care that can go into analysis like this. Yes, Maharaj. These are very deep points, actually. I have talked about. You have some more slides to show, Maharaj. I have discussed about interfaith with. I don't remember if I have more slides. I have discussed with Anantama Prabhu about interfaith and the purpose, but the principles that you are giving over here are are very deep. So mm -hmm. that idea of uh, first uh, now avoiding simplistic oneness, all these four points are are very practical for us to avoid at the same time, uh, one, on one side an exclusivist attitude and other side of also a relativist attitude, both. Yeah. This is a, I would say that even within India, where there are various uh, strands of Vedic thought available uh, or manifest, you know, we have different forms of worship of the devatas and different uh, different ideas going on. Sometimes there is a very dismissive approach towards other traditions or other ways of worshiping, other ways of conceiving. So, feel mm. this could be this could give a lot of. Uh, what it will give a lot of resources for devotees to engage in a way that is that is not alienating. Right. <clears throat> yes, Maharaj. It involves developing a certain culture which um, is um, Like any culture, it takes time, but we, we can develop it, I think, within our society as we gradually become mature. And that, that's the purpose of the little seminar that I do called Dialogical Vaishnavism, to try to provoke uh, devotees or encourage devotees to think, um, to get this culture, and then to be able to participate uh, with others in such a culture, to bring others into such a culture, if you like. Is it, uh, is the seminar available online or it's? <laughs> um, we'd have to look, I think it's been recorded, but the audio has not been very well done. 
unfortunately. Oh, okay. Uh, the last I gave in Mayapur, and they have video camera, but I think the audio was not very good. Oh, okay. So maybe that's something that we can do after we finish the 10 avatars. Yes, ma that could be a wonderful thing. So, broadly speaking, uh, I think uh, more than getting into the specifics of Buddha's, uh, Buddha's uh, either historicity or pastimes, the approach that which you took was was more was actually more relevant for us in today's world because in this because as compared to say the other avatars we don't have the chal there is no distinct tradition that has come from the various avatars and yes of course there is ram bhakti but then there is no major conflict there is sometimes a little bit but otherwise ram and krishna are understood the same person so yeah. i feel that what you shared was was very you could say like buddha buddha focuses buddha focuses more on a pragmatic approach than a philosophical approach so you showed how mm. you know, we could approach philosophy in a more pragmatic way where mm. where we can have constructive engagement with other traditions yes maharaj should i try to summarize or you would like to add a few things um, I would just uh, suggest uh, for when, whenever things um, in India become, you know, back to some sort of normal, uh, devotees like to go on pilgrimage. Um, this may sound kind of surprising, but I suggest to some, very few devotees uh, go to Bodh Gaya. Um, there's Gaya and there's Bodh Gaya. And Gaya is a place of pilgrimage for Gaudiya Vaishnavas because that's where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu right, yes. um, had this hugely transformative experience. <clears throat> and very close to Gaya is Bodh Gaya. And Bodh Gaya is a major center of Buddhism. Uh, for Buddhists all over the world. When you go there, you will see, um, it's very interesting, you'll see from so many different countries they come. And when I visited there, I was very impressed with how nicely, how clean they're keeping the whole area around the main temple. There are also many uh, many ashrams there, like Tibetan Buddhist ashram, and I don't know, from Taiwan, this and that. And it's just actually a very nice, nice atmosphere. And you can get a little feel for, uh, you know, the living Buddhist tradition today in what I would say is a very uplifting way. You can, you can, you can go to the what is considered to be a descendant of the Bodhi tree under which the Buddha is said to have sat when he uh, had his enlightenment. And uh, that would just be a suggestion to do a pilgrimage there. Yeah, otherwise, that's all I have. Okay, Maharaj. I think this is, uh, yeah, going to, fill, you said that many non-Indians, the Chinese don't know much about Buddhism coming from India, but I think within in the devotee community, while we acknowledge that Buddhism came from India, but the sanctity of uh, the, the places associated with Buddha, like Bodh Gaya, that is not so yeah. much highlighted. Actually, when yeah. I started, uh, when I started doing my Western outreach and started studying Western perceptions of India, that's when it struck me that for many people who come from the West to India, those are spiritual seekers. Bodh Gaya is a prominent place of uh, pilgrimage for them. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. 
Yes, Maharaj. So, I think today was a little uh, different, non-conventional or different kind of podcast we had. As so, yeah, I hope I hope I didn't depart too much from your no, no, usual. That's perfectly fine. I mean, it was it was good because we did we our ultimate purpose is to share some resources for contemplation and action for devotees through this podcast discussions. So. we started by talking about he quoted the shautar buddhas how buddhas mission is seen differently within the vaishnavism and buddhism so we discussed the similarities the similarities even the historicity of buddha is questioned by some scholars although it is more or less accepted and while while bhakti pragyan maharaj talks about the bhagavatam buddha and the buddhism buddha being two different Uh, beings prabhupada doesn't Bhakti mention pragyan keshava bhakti pragyan keshava maharaj yeah yeah so prabhupada does not make that difference and then you made this point that what are seen as differences so two points that st- struck me that when i said that the buddhism in the west is quite different from traditional buddhism so i think you used a buddhist deconstructionist approach toward my statement so you said that there are <laughs> several hundred expressions of buddhism just in the bay area or several several hundred buddhist groups in the bay area so american buddhism itself american or western buddhism itself is a huge diverse uh, you diverse thing and similarly traditional buddhism also is quite diverse because so there is the, the main characterization of theravada and mahayan but uh, from there so many more a diversity diverse expressions have also come up so that essentialism we cannot really use but there is some history of how buddhism came to um, came to west to america and spread and then we discussed about the point of the difference over the conception of atma in the anatma now you mentioned that anatmavad is also not necessarily accepted by there are many both scholars of buddhism and practitioners teachers of buddhism who say that buddha didn't really endorse anatmavad so it was more of a process of uh, it's it's more like they say it's more like they say it is not clear yes so it's a uh, overall i think you made this point that it's more of a uh, attitude of deconstruction which does not necessarily arrive at one conclusion any one categorical conclusion attitude mm-hmm. of continuous qu- continuous questioning and then when we discussed about how we engage with buddhism because buddhism is a active tradition in today's world both in the west as well as in india and then you are also doing your teaching in china where it is quite prominent so rather than have a in our interactions originate from insecurity so they should they need to arise from conviction and the way to preserve our conviction is not so much by imposing it on others not by vitanda or jalpa but by by vada by some what is samvad or by va- just vada vada okay vada is yeah by vada So samvada that means dialogue. Dialogue, dialogue, yeah. So samvada is respectful or honest search for truth, and yeah. jalpa is just jalpa is just the focus is defeating the opponent, and vitanda is almost insulting, not just defeating but even deriding or insulting. Yeah. So and then you gave us an example of how that could be that kind of uh, engagement could be done with the bodhi dharma, uh, and. we had some you had this slide show with a point by point comparison of several of the teachings of bodhi dharma and bhagavad gita uh, several mm-hmm. some comparisons were quite evident and some comparisons were quite creative you could say that <laughs> <laughs> so of course there are very standard striking terms like pragya sita pragya and nirvan and brahma nirvana and buddhi and buddhi yoga and then dharma yeah. itself dharma yeah yeah so so based on that the idea is 
I think uh, the concluding slide which you mentioned was that we our purpose of comparison. You said that if we just say these are apples and oranges, that is just a dismissal of the attitude of comparison of the whole exercise of comparing, and we can't avoid comparing because it comparing is in one sense intrinsic to thinking. Mm -hmm. So, so we avoid simple, simplistic sameness. But uh, as you talk about this Francis Clooney's approach, that you put the two texts side by side, and then we place the teaching or the message in the broader human condition. And I feel if compassion is the driving value for understanding, then we all can uh, have a more nuanced and less alienating approach when we engage with other traditions. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. Any other points that I? Of course, there are some technicalities we discuss also about the comparison between Bodhi Dharma and Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, I like your translations also where you have done of Gita. Mm. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's a big topic. We all all we can do is touch on some some uh, points of possible, you know, further exploration. Yes. You also mentioned the parallax metaphor, which was quite good for understanding, oh. for getting a clearer vision of things. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much. This has been a, I would say personally for me, I learned a lot more about both about Buddhism and about how to bring about parallels. Actually, I had read about Buddhism in Buddhism, but I had not read specific, specifically about Bodhidharma so much. So, thank yeah, you. Somehow, I don't remember how it came across Bodhidharma, but. I became fascinated by uh, his story and his ever so brief teachings. Yes. So yeah. Um, so next time, I think we are coming to our final of the ten avatars, Kalki avatar. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Let's see what. I don't think we have a movement of Kalkiism. So <laughs> yeah. We'll have to see where that discussion goes. Yes, I look forward to that. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru. Hare Krishna. Thank you.